Thank you and welcome to the Homestead Fund's fourth quarter market review. Very interesting topic, vaccine fuels a healthy finish for investments. I'm Mark Sintero and I'll be your moderator today and appreciate as always the opportunity to share with you our views, uh, not only what went on in the fourth quarter, but what we see going ahead. And with me today are two of our senior portfolio manager, Mar Mauricio Aguadello, our head of fixed income, and Jim Polk, our senior equity portfolio manager. And I appreciate the two of them sharing their views with our investors. So what are we gonna cover today? Basically runs the same format as always. We're gonna cover the macroeconomic conditions and factors. We'll talk a little bit about the fund's absolute and relative performance. We'll look at the drivers of returns, and then we'll end with our outlook and fund positioning. So let's get started. Let's talk about the fourth quarter. Jim, why don't you take us away? Great, thanks Mark and welcome everybody. Well, if the fourth quarter capped a unprecedented crazy year. Big picture, you had this, what we thought was gonna be a muddle along kind of at the start of the year, economy and then obviously we got thrown into this pandemic and the markets reacted and what you saw in the fourth quarter was in some ways a continuation of what you saw in maybe the second and third quarters to some extent you had a fed that remained very accommodative and very easy monetary policy and i i'm, I'm sure mauricio will go into more detail about that you also had fiscal stimulus coming that was throwing everything they could at it. So in the fourth quarter, you had Fed, you had the fiscal, you had vaccinations that were now being introduced and people started getting more and more optimistic. And then you had an election which was controversial, but you got behind you. So there was some resolution there and markets hate when things are not more clear. And so getting that stuff behind us, whether or not there was gonna be a vaccine and the election, were all positive. Clearly there's some industries that are being hurt, but even they are getting better. The energy sector has started to rebound. Anecdotally, people wanna get back out and either go on cruises or vacations or restaurants. So there's more optimism and that was being felt in the fourth quarter, uh, despite COVID numbers going up, uh, that was starting to get better. And so the equity markets reflected that. The equity markets had a positive response to these sort of positive things that were going on. And with that, I turn it over to, uh, to Mauricio to talk about the fixed income markets. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, absolutely, on the fixed income side, the bond market followed a similar path as, as the equity market in terms of the uh, of the recovery uh, during the quarter uh, the bond market posted another strong quarter to finish a, a pretty strong year overall five years and in uh, u.s treasury yields remained anchored near the fed's zero target uh, while longer dated treasury yields those matures with 10 years and out aged a little higher and as in your comment about how the the fed remained very accommodative to support the ongoing recovery the environment for corporate credit remained very robust credit spreads which are the difference between corporate yields and treasury yields continue to compress in fact by one measure which is the bloomberg uh, barclays uh, corporate credit oas finishing at pre-COVID levels. Uh, so credit spreads pretty much did a, a round trip throughout the year, finishing flat at the end of uh, 2020. The amount of liquidity and support provided by the Fed and the boost provided by the development of the, uh, of the two vaccines that were approved for emergency use at the end of the year gave investors further visibility into the ongoing recovery. And finally, the credit market sold less issuance of new corporate bonds versus uh, the prior two quarters. 
this backdrop also provided a, a positive technical for credit spreads. And with that, let me turn it back to you, Mark. Thanks, Mauricio, and thank you, Jim. It's important to look back and see how the funds performed in light of what we just went over as the markets behaved in the fourth quarter. So let's talk about our fixed income portfolios first, and uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Mauricio to start with our short-term bond fund. The uh, short-term bond fund rose 0.82% in the quarter, performing uh, its benchmark, the uh, Bank of America one to five year corporate gov index, which returned 0.37%. Uh, For the calendar year, the fund um, outperformed the benchmark as well, 542 versus 465. Now, what worked during the quarter? Our corporate bond holdings in the financials and industrial sectors aided relative returns. The ABS sector, which basically consumer loans and auto loans, on our part, was another positive contributor to performance. Now, what didn't work are underweight allocation to a sovereign and supranational sectors where we have zero exposure. We don't really see a ton of value in those in those sectors, and that detracted from from performance. If we turn to the uh, next slide, the fund remains uh, very well diversified with an overweight allocation to corporates and the ABS sectors while we are underweight um, treasuries at this point in time. Now, turning to the intermediate bond fund, the fund returned 1.51% in the fourth quarter, outperforming the benchmark via Bloomberg Barclays uh, Aggregate Bond Index, which rose 0.67%, a really strong quarter for the intermediate bond fund, which contributed to our performance for the year of 8.7 versus 7.51% for the benchmark. Now, what worked during the quarter? In similar fashion to a short-term bond fund, our corporate bond holdings in financials and industrials helped returns. Additionally, the municipal sector added to a relative performance. We started to become quite active in the taxable unit space in the fourth quarter, as we saw new issue opportunities there. Now, what didn't work during the quarter? Our underweight allocation to sovereign and CMBS sectors where we had no exposure that detracted from performance. Next, the, the fund is, is very well diversified with an overweight allocation to corporates and the ABS sectors while we are underweight uh, treasuries and MBS. And finally, the, the fund's duration ended the year relatively close to that of its benchmark. And that's the uh, recap for the uh, fixed income funds. Thank you very much, Mauricio, much appreciated. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jim to discuss the two equity portfolios. Jim? Well, if you look at the performance numbers, we slightly underperformed the benchmark in the fourth quarter. But what I call your attention to is the fact that the fund and the benchmark were up in the mid-teens in terms of performance for one quarter, which we're pleased with that, but that just kind of goes back to what both Mauricio and I were talking about before, just the tremendous stimulus that was happening in the quarter. So the value fund was ju just about 14.8% and probably a similar fashion to the fixed income portfolios. It was really more the cyclical sectors that work. Groups like energy, financials, and industrials led the way. For us, it was really driven by long-term holding top 10 names like Honeywell, Avery Dennison, Parker Hannifin in the industrial and material space. And our lack of energy exposure is kind of what hurt us. If you look down at the portfolio metrics, you can see that we tend to be overweight healthcare and tech, two sectors that we really believe have long-term secular trends, tech with things like artificial intelligence, automation, healthcare's got demographics, 
new drugs. So we really like to be there. So if you have a quarter or even a couple of quarters where it's going to be really cyclically driven, there's a potential to lag there. But we also do barbell that with more cyclical exposure, just a little bit less. So we do have overweights in industrials and materials. And although optically we are underweight financials, we are actually overweight banks. One last thought on that is just a reminder that just kind of our philosophy really is that over time, a portfolio comprised of higher quality stocks with reasonable valuations will outperform the market. And what you saw in the fourth quarter was really a lot of that rebound trade. So a lot of lower quality names, a lot of cyclical names. So we're just not as exposed there. And if you turn the, to the small company, the, the, the story was really the same. It was a quarter that when you look at the Russell 2000 benchmark, it was up 31% in the quarter and we were up 22%. Really good absolute performance. And when you look at it for year to date, we outperformed, although we did underperform in the quarter. Unlike the large cap, some of this was really driven by stock selection, which is not atypical. Let's put it that way. It's not atypical uh, in any given quarter for some volatile single stock returns. Same sort of macro overview and same exposures. We really like the healthcare space. We like the tech space for the longer term secular reasons. We do have a good weighting in cyclical names, but more so in the small company product fund than the large strategy. Again, any given quarter could be plus or minus based on some stock picks. Some of the stocks in our healthcare sector, like Twist Biosciences and Nanostring and Star Surgical, were actually up over 40% in a quarter. We have that barbell approach that we have in the value strategy. Secularly, we really do like healthcare and tech and higher quality companies. And with, with that, Mark, I turn it back to you. Thanks, Jim, and thanks again, Mauricio. One thing I think is important to note, 2020, by everybody's account, was one of the most uh, bizarre, crazy years that we've all experienced. And I think we can honestly say we hope we never do again. We had four market reviews, and I think that we've had four different economies present in 2020 if you look at how each quarter performed. And we just reviewed the fourth quarter, which was a strong quarter in, in, in a pandemic that saw a lot of rebound trades and credit availability. What's most important though, is every portfolio that we reviewed today, the two on the fixed and two on the equity side, over the course of 2020 outperformed their benchmark, which again, when you think about 2020 and having four economy cycles in one year, it's a testament to our investment management expertise that over the course of that, those four volatile quarters, we outperformed our benchmark. So a great job by the investment team. Enough about what happened in the past. What's going to happen going forward? I will say that if you go to our website, homesteadfunds.com, we do have our market outlook, which goes into a little greater detail on what's ahead, but it it wouldn't be a review, quarterly review, if we didn't ask our PMs to talk about their views uh, on the opportunities going forward. So I'm going to turn it back over to Mauricio to cover opportunities in the bond market for 21. Mauricio? Yes, Mark. To our audience, I like to point to this chart, which basically reflects the uh, level of uh, credit spreads relative to the five-year um, U.S. Um, Treasury yield. And, and as we highlight here, 2020 was certainly an opportunity for active management, and that's what we we strive to provide day in and day out for our investors. We certainly capture those opportunities that became available. Now, credit spreads, as I mentioned before, they have come back to uh, pre-COVID levels. 
yet we still see a lot of potential in corporate bonds at this point, financials and industrials, and that's reflected in our positioning. Given the, the ratio overall of the yield that's offered by corporate bonds versus the, the respective treasury at that point. And, and also this is supported by the accumulated stance of the Fed. So on the monetary front, we expect the Fed to, to remain on the sidelines. Rates will be anchored near zero in the front end. The new administration is already taking steps to provide more, more fiscal uh, stimulus to uh, support and aid the, uh, the ongoing economic recovery. It will be very dynamic and we see a lot of value in, in corporates. Outside of corporates, we see value in ABS. Like I mentioned before, consumer loans and, and auto loans, uh, those are uh, two segments of the ABS market where we have high conviction. And last but not least, the taxable muni market is certainly providing uh, a lot of opportunities for our investors, and we are certainly uh, digging through those constantly. With that, let me uh, pass it along to Jim to give us an outlook on the uh, equity markets. Thanks, Mauricio. I would look at this chart and go, it's working, right? Like the, the, the Fed's accommodative policies, fiscal policies uh, are showing that there's projected growth, you know, in the economies, in, in worldwide economies, in, in the U.S. economy. And so we think that with the Fed's accommodative stance, you've got a potential fiscal bill of, you know, current estimates around 1.9 trillion. There's talk of student loan debt being, you know, relieved. So you've got a lot of momentum building in the economy. As I said before, people want to get out. Household savings are up year over year. There's a lot of pent up demand in the economy, which makes us cautiously optimistic because there are a couple of sort of offsets to that. One is valuations aren't super cheap, right? So we, we want to be careful and we have a long term focus. And so we want to be a little careful about allocating capital. And so we're sifting through stuff both on the large side and the small cap side. The second thing that's going on in the market that I want to touch on briefly is that GameStop phenomenon that's been occurring where you're getting these speculative traders and day traders who are jacking up the, the prices on a lot of these left for dead companies, certainly in the back of our minds, obviously a little bit of speculative fever there because some of these prices are, are clearly disconnected from the fundamentals of these companies. That is something that we stay away from. We are longer term investors, but it does represent some speculative fever in the market that we want to be leery of. And I, I would echo Mauricio's comments about active management not being sucked into that vortex and chasing those sorts of things. And again, that could hurt you in any given quarter, but we think over time being exposed to higher quality companies with good fundamentals is, is the way to win. And Mark, I turn that back to you. Great. Thank you, Mauricio. Thank you, Jim, for giving us a little bit of what happened in 2020 and most importantly, what we see in 21. I want to thank all our shareholders, all our investors for supporting the funds. If you require any information or have any questions, please send me an email or give me a call. That's my direct line and that's my email. We're here to help in any way we can. So thank you for listening and have a wonderful day.